Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad that you've joined us. We're doing a series on the book of Galatians. Galatians is a very provocative book. It raises lots of questions, and we hope that you're enjoying our study together. Right now, we're doing lesson number three in a series of 13, and this one is entitled The Unity of the Gospel, and it's intended for study in October 15 of 2011. Before we start, I would like to offer a word of prayer, and I would like invite you to bow your heads with me. Our loving Father, as we consider once again this message, this Paul presented so long ago in the book of Galatians, may we see the unity that he wants us to see and avoid the diversity, well, incorporating the diversity, avoiding the divisiveness that he wanted to avoid is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> this lesson is about unity and diversity within the Christian church. It should be clear from Galatians 3, 28 and 29, and let me just read that. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. This, of course, reminds us of the famous Jewish male prayer of long years ago. Uh, they, they, they woke up early in the morning and they said, God, I thank you that I was not born a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. And, of course, Paul is responding to that very nicely, I think, in, in, in this passage. Uh, there, it also says that something similar in Colossians 3, verse 11. As a result, Paul says, there is no longer any distinction between Gentiles and Jews, uh, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarians, savages, slaves, free, but Christ is all and Christ is in all. I Why was that an issue to him? Well, it was an issue because his enemies were trying to make a big deal out of it. And Paul says, I don't care. It doesn't make any difference. We are all saved on the same basis. We're not saved on the basis of you're being a Jew and you've been circumcised and I'm not a Jew and I haven't been circumcised. No, we're saved on the basis of faith in Christ. That's the Christian it was message. It's a big issue that these guys followed him around all the time and he mm -hmm. had to deal with that. I mean, imagine committing your life to that kind of a trying to tear somebody down somebody else's gospel. I mean, it's, it seems incredible to me. Well, we, we, we all know, uh, I mean, if we think about it for a little bit, that if the Christian church is going to grow and spread and enter new areas in the world, sooner or later there's going to be new nations, new situations, and there's new cultures, and there's going to have to be a certain amount of diversity. How is that going to impact the gospel? John Calvin was one of the founders of Protestantism. He was a part of the Protestant Reformation. He believed that disunity and division were the devil's chief devices against the church. But that same John Calvin did not hesitate to stand up against the recognized church of his time. He was a Protestant. He was, a Protestant. He was protesting what the usual church teachings were. However, he also thought it was necessary to burn at the stake another Protestant reformer who happened to be an Arian and believed in the believed that Christ's divinity was a little bit less than the Father's divinity. What would have happened if Martin Luther, the father of the Protestant Reformation, had chosen to conform to this for the sake of unity instead of standing up for salvation by faith alone? The rocks would have cried out. Yeah. <coughs> Ellen White says in Great Controversy, page 166, had the reformer yielded a single point Satan and his hosts would have gained the victory, but his unwavering firmness was the means of emancipating the church and beginning a new and better era. And of course, she's talking about the Protestant Reformation. Now, when he was doing that, was he causing diverse division? Absolutely. Oh, wow, was he ever. Okay, so to say that it's not Christian to cause division is incorrect. Right? That, absolutely. That, that is correct. Okay, we'll take that assumption. This does okay. not teach ecumenism. This is not the purpose of this book. Ecumenism as in what? Well, can't we all just get along? Don't speak ill of some other philosophy. 
ecumenism is put put your unessential differences aside. Let's all just concentrate on, on what we have in common and let's all get along together. The Greek word oikomene means a big house. It means let's all be brothers and sisters and <clears throat> if you don't agree with me that doesn't really matter. We all live in the same place. Well, but there's part of that that you have to have within the Christian community because of the different cultures and the different beliefs. You have to have a core belief in what's the most important. Yeah. Well, let's take an example well, right out of 15, wasn't it? Yeah, let's take an example right out of the book of Galatians. Turn to chapter 2. I'm reading from the Good News Bible. 14 years later, this is 14 years after his Damascus Road experience, I went back to Jerusalem with Barnabas taking Titus along with me. Now, what do we know about Titus? He was a Greek. He was Greek. Fully, father was Greek, mother was Greek, not Jewish at all, okay? I went because God revealed to me that I should go. So this gives us evidence that God spoke to Paul on a pretty regular basis, right? In a private meeting with the leaders, I explained the gospel message that I preached to the Gentiles. I did not want my, my work in the past or in the present to be a failure. My companion Titus, even though he is a Greek, was not forced to be circumcised, although some wanted it done. Pretending to be fellow believers, these men slipped into our group as spies in order to find out about the freedom we had through our union with Christ Jesus. They wanted to make slaves of us, but in order to keep the truth of the gospel safe for you, we did not give in to them for a minute. So my first question now is, <coughs> what were these spies doing? What Wait, they were on the circumcision committee. Mm -hmm. And what were they doing? They were keeping score. <laughs> Taking names. <laughs> yeah. Take a name. Why did he call them spies? What do you think? Uh, no, asking you. <laughs> well, these guys were trying to figure out whether this man that, that Paul and Barnabas were bringing into the Christian, or the, the General Conference Committee, if you will, see, and here's a man they brought in. Is this guy circumcised or isn't he? Is it safe for us to sit down at the same table with him? Well, usually a spy is somebody who re who goes in, gets the information, and tells it to well, the enemy. Yeah, I suppose they want to know. They want to know is this guy circumcised? You'd have to make a pretty particular observation in order to answer that question. <laughs> okay, but who would he be? <laughs> who would be he be reporting his findings to? The Judaizers. The Judaizers. The Judaizers. Well, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, I thought he was talking about the Judaizers. Well. Well, <laughs> look what Paul goes on to say, starting with verse 6. But those who seem to be the leaders, I say this because it makes no difference to me what they were, God does not judge by outward appearances. Those leaders, I say, make no new, made no new suggestions to me. Is that the way to talk about your church leaders? They didn't tell me anything. Well, they didn't tell me anything new. Okay. They didn't tell me anything I didn't know already. Okay, but you can I've say that. I've been to a lot no, of sermons I, like that. I've, I, <laughs> stuff I've heard over and over again. I can go out and say, I didn't learn anything from these guys. They didn't tell me anything new. Fair. Yeah. But would you say those who seem to be leaders, I say this because it makes no difference to me what they were? Seemed to now, be he good. wasn't asking them for what the truth was. Mm -hmm. He was more than happy to tell them what he was doing, and he would define mm -hmm. that as truth. Mm -hmm. Were they coming in as, quotes, the authority? They had gone down to Jerusalem to meet with the authorities. So they presented themselves as authorities. But wasn't mm -hmm. the motive to do that, hopefully to get the the General Conference Committee to understand what Paul was doing and get them to sanction it and get these other guys off their back. Yeah. 
Well, he goes on, on the contrary, they saw that God had given me the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as he had given Peter the task of preaching the gospel to the Jews. For God's power, for by God's power, I was made an apostle to the Gentiles, just as Peter was made an apostle to the Jews. What's Paul trying to say to us here? It was a special and unique calling. Yeah. Yeah. I, he was saying, I have, a mission. I have authority. It comes from God. And my authority is to carry a message where? To the Gentiles. To the Gentiles. Peter has authority. His authority came from God. And where is his message? To the Jews. To the Jews. Right. Okay. I wouldn't put it that way. You I would, would say that the authority is coming through those people at two different angles. From God. Sure, from God. That's what I from said. From God. No, you said that they had the authority. From God. From God. God. I said from God. Yeah. Well, all the authority comes from God. Yeah. That's right. So they didn't really have authority. It came from God. <laughs> well, <laughs> give it up. <laughs> where, where is James and John? Why, how come they don't have any authority? Well, we're in time. For God's power, uh, I'm sorry, verse 9, James Peter and John, now this is James, the brother of Jesus, not James, who the, John's brother has already been, already been beheaded, who seemed to be the leaders, recognized that God had given me this special task. So they shook hands with Barnabas and me as a sign that we were all partners. We agreed that Barnabas and I would work among the Gentiles and they among the Jews. All they asked was that we should remember the needy in their group, which is the very thing I have been eager to do. So, so he thought he got what he was after when he went down there. Yes. But they didn't communicate that to their to the rest well, of the, the, the well, Judaizers. Yeah, the Judaizers went had a different opinion, and we read about that. Uh, look at look at Acts 15 again. But then their opinion was not that of the General Conference Committee. No. No. Okay. Look at look at Acts 15. Some people came from Judea to Antioch and started teaching the believers. Now, where did Paul and Barnabas come from? Where was their home church, quote? Antioch. This was Paul and Barnabas' home church. So some people came from Jerusalem up to Antioch. You cannot be saved unless you are circumcised as the law of Moses requires. Okay? Paul and Barnabas well, these, got... These are, these are the Judaizers. These are, these are friends of Peter. Because well, they would be well, kind of associates. Peter's, where he's preaching to the Jews, and so these people are. They would say that they guys. were friends of Peter. They would claim to be friends of Peter. <laughs> they, Paul and Barnabas got into a fierce argument with them about this. I mean, you think our discussions are pretty animated here? These guys were. <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine? And so it was decided that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others in Antioch should go to Jerusalem and see the apostles and elders about this matter. And we already mentioned what happened. They got down there. And, but some of the believers, verse 5, who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. Was Peter one of those guys? Doesn't say that. <laughs> well, didn't they go consult with those people was, down there? I mean, there isn't that what they're saying? They, they went down there to check it out with the GC boys? Well, what, what Paul and Barnabas did... I think they were very clever. These people were guided by God, I absolutely believe. Because who did they take with them? Titus. Titus, who was a Greek, a Greek not, not circumcised, circumcised. And they marched into the headquarters with this man, and they forced the brethren to deal with the issue of circumcision. Right? Yeah. Because if, if you think it's not safe to sit down at a table or sit, even be in a room with an uncircumcised person, then you got a problem. Right? Well, Paul is pretty clear about how he feels about dividing the church up into groups that are squabbling about who has more authority. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting with verse 10. By the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, I appeal to all of you, my brothers and sisters, to agree in what you say so, there, so that there will be no divisions among you. Be completely united with only one thought and one purpose. For some people from Chloe's family have told me quite plainly, my friends, that there are quarrels among you. Let me put it this way. 
Each one of you says something different. One says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Peter. And another, I follow Christ. Christ has, has Christ been divided into groups? Was Paul, was it Paul who died on the cross for you? Were you baptized as Paul's disciples? And he goes on. He was, he was very much in favor of unity. But unity at what cost? On the basis of what? Well, when Paul and Barnabas went down to Jerusalem for the conference in AD 49, there were many questions about the gospel. We've already talked about this. And Paul and Barnabas set their gospel out before the people down there, James and John and Peter. And they, get, they what did it say? They got the right hand of fellowship. They said, your gospel is the right one. Take it to the Gentiles. Okay? Now look at uh, another comment by Paul found in Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. I urge you, now Paul is talking to the Philippians in this case, I urge you then to make me completely happy by having the same thoughts, sharing the same love, and being one in soul and mind. Um, what would happen if Christians really did that? Well, what do you mean by one soul and mind? Does it, does it mean that your thoughts are all completely the same? No. Does it mean that you, can have, you don't have any different ideas, you don't have any different ways of looking at things, or that you never disagree? Well, Jesus put it this way, John 13, 35. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. That's right, love but it doesn't necessarily mean that they agree on everything. I mean, like I said, if, if, um, if a person disagrees with me and I... He's wrong and you're right. I'm, Why are you pointing he's, at me? Well, <laughs> say that you're right and I'm wrong, but, but you know, we, we're both at where we're at. The, the problem is, what am I going to do about that? Am I gonna, going to display love, or am I going to start picking up a chair and hitting him over the head? That's, that's the question right there. Well, in Paul's case, this was the question. At what point was circumcision no longer a mark of God's true followers? <clears throat> in Paul's day, was it nothing more than a legalistic tradition? That's pretty theological. Uh... Most Christians would say, you know, at, you know, uh, at the cross, all of that was settled, I suppose. Or when Jesus came, some might say, you know, when the Shekinah departed. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you a very pointed question in terms of this Galatian thing. Does whether or not a person is circumcised have anything to do with whether it's, whether it's safe to sit down with him at the table? That was the question. That was the question. Is there anything wrong with being circumcised? <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing, I mean, it's... But it, isn't there an underlining question of how these people are reacting to each other because of these mm -hmm. questions? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're kind of talking about grace here, and whether it's there or not. You know, whether you'll be able to take somebody else's idea or, or not. In a moment or two, we're going to come to reading the next part of Galatians 2. And it turns out that apparently even some of the people from headquarters thought that that was a big issue. Whether it was safe to eat at the same table with Gentiles who were not circumcised. Yeah, the only problem with, with this is that we don't get to see how... Um, how red under the collar, collar they were or not. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. Uh -huh. And it, you got to read that indirectly in here. Well, don't you think Paul sounds pretty animated over what he has to say? Animated, but always in, under control. Yeah. And never get to the point where okay. well, you want to get somebody okay. back. So l let's, let's take it to the next level. Does that have anything to do with the gospel itself? Does that what? being circumcision? Well, yeah. 
this circumcision or whether it's safe to eat with someone who's not circumcised or whether it's safe to sit down at the table with them, whether it's safe to be in the same house with them, does that have anything to do with the gospel? It has nothing to do with the gospel. Nothing to do with the gospel. Might it have for some people? If if oh, some it if, to do with the if, so, if if one of, if these people in their heart of hearts yeah. felt that that was necessary, and then they said, "Oh, I think I'll just give up on that point and 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 violate my conscience." Wouldn't that be a problem? Sounds like it. Yeah, but the problem is, like I said, what are they going to do about it? Are they going to throw a chair at each other? Or are they then going to they, sit down and civilize and keep talking about it yeah. to come out with something reasonable? Well, yeah. Cir yeah. Circumcision may not have been the issue here. I mean, what difference does it make whether you're circumcised or not? If they these people said, it made a difference. If, if these people, they need to be circumcised, why didn't Paul just say, I mean, he was, you know, we, we, we read uh, passages from Paul that it was very uh, generous about it. It doesn't make any what you eat and drink yeah. and so on Romans and so 14. forth. So, so why doesn't he just say the same thing about circumcision? You know, go ahead and get circumcised. What difference does it make? Why well, didn't that's, he, what, that's what Paul was trying to say, but they were not willing to say that. They were trying to say, you have well, to be know, circumcised or you can't be saved. Ah. So their they're, religion they're in, they're in is the problem. Yes, that's exactly right. Their you religion was made up of a round of ceremonies through the performance of which they expected to gain favor with God. Yeah. And that is what Paul was trying to get away from. Well, yeah. They right. had this whole notion of how they could work and be saved. Yep. And Paul was had to fight that everywhere he well, went. Well, let, let's look at the background. It, it's helpful to sort of understand where they came from. Circumcision was first given to Abraham, Genesis 17, as a sign, separating him from his pagan neighbors. It was probably given, almost certainly given, so that if any male should be attempted to get, and this would be any descendant of, of Abraham's, should be tempted to get involved with the rampant fertility cult religions, so-called, surrounding them, it would be impossible for him to hide the fact that he was a member of Abraham's clan. Clearly, circumcision was only intended for the male descendants of Abraham. Nothing in the Bible suggests that any similar ceremony should be performed on females. So unless you believe all females are going to be lost, you don't have to be circumcised to be saved, right? I mean, think about that. Yeah. Yet all descendants of Abraham were invited into the covenant relationship with God. So in Paul's day, what was the function of circumcision? Was the outward circumcision always a clear symbol of the circumcision of the heart? You know, Deuteronomy 10, 16, and 36, and Jeremiah 4, 4, and Romans 2, 29 talk about that. It says, the circumcision that matters, the change in a person's life that matters is what happens in here and in here, not what happens somewhere down there. Well, and so the question then becomes, is circumcision, does circumcision represent salvation by works? So when, when they went, well, it probably does, but when they went down to, <laughs> when they went down, to, doing anything to, to, to get right with God is, is doing that thinking that's going to say that that's a righteousness or by works. But when they went down there to the GC boys in Jerusalem and mm -hmm. took Titus with them and all of that stuff, who did they encounter down there? And, and the next question is, I mean, these are, this is where it all happened. This is where Jesus did his thing, and that's probably where the cores of the Christians were and the strongest part of the church and all of that mm -hmm. stuff. And I don't know, was Peter down there at this time? Yes. So, okay, so how is it? How is it that these people, I mean, Peter, they spent all this time with Jesus and they didn't get this figured out. And even Peter had already had that experience with, with Cornelius. So how are they, how can this be such a, how can you, they've spent all this time with Jesus and still be confused over well, where we're saying it's righteousness by if, works. If you remember our first lesson, we went through all those steps. Jesus went step by step 
painful step by painful step by painful step trying to convince his disciples that there is no difference between Gentiles and Jews and that the gospel should go to all of them. And it was not easy. I mean, he went baby step by baby step. Well, didn't they learn it? Well, <laughs> no, you know, they didn't. Maybe eventually. <laughs> that is hard to, that's well, hard to fathom how they could have spent all that time and still not understood you know yeah it is you you you, you, you well, works is still a part of your getting but, through those pearly gates but don't you think all this is just drilling down to our issue of freedom partly <coughs> partly i don't know what you <laughs> partly <laughs> explain that what do you mean well l look being forced to do something unnecessary is encroachment on your freedom isn't it being forced to? Well, it, it's whether or not you consider it to be necessary. That's if right. If you think God requires and that's it. What, that's what Paul was trying to get at. It's not necessary. Well, who says and it's not necessary? It's, it's not necessary. Point. It's not necessary. So it, you have the freedom not to do it. That's what, that's what the whole thing on the top is about. Okay. But as you drill down, you're trying to prove that it's not necessary, and that's what we're going through here. Okay, is clearly, circumcision was a prized sign of Jewish national identity. There's no question about that. Approximately 150 years before Jesus' birth, Palestinian Jews forced all males living in their territories and even some in surrounding nations which fell under their jurisdiction to be circumcised. They're, they're saying, you can't even live in our country unless you're circumcised. Some believed it was essential for salvation. They are, there are even ancient epigrams declaring circumcised men do not descend into Gehenna, which is another word for hell. Okay, so... That makes why it pretty are, important. Why are yeah, we even arguing right about out. <laughs> Why is this even being argued about as far as the Christian religion goes? Well, look at the Old Testament. There, oh, Abraham was told to circumcise everyone. They weren't Christians. It's been Christians. down through the age. <laughs> but how, Christians weren't even invented there. Well, of course not, but... I know it was, the truth it was the is same still there. Line of, it was the same line of people. Oh, well, that's well, true. And that's what and, they were saying. You had to come up through that same line of people to become a Christian. And, and Paul was saying, no, you don't. But I would remind you that when Timothy said, I would like to join you, Paul. Now, Timothy's father was Greek, but his mother was Jewish. Jewish. So when Paul says, Timothy, yes, you can join me. Let's work together, but you need to be circumcised. Well, isn't that a little bit of sacrifice to get the point across? <laughs> I mean, to get the to get the um, message out. Sometimes you got to do some. You got to cut your hair so you don't get so you can go into the enemy's rank and not be so, thought, so found. Was, was Peter doing the same thing then when he wouldn't eat with the uh, with the Greeks down in Jerusalem, but That's when he got the up question. there, he would? What is the core issue here? Is this a question about salvation being by faith alone, our relationship to God, and it doesn't matter whether you're circumcised, doesn't matter whether you're not circumcised, doesn't matter who you eat with, or is it faith plus works? Yes, faith matters, but there's a certain number of things you have to do also. So, so as far as Abraham is concerned, and Isaac and Ishmael and Jacob, mm -hmm. um, in order for them to be saved, they didn't have to be circumcised either. They were, all of them. I know that, but they didn't have to be circumcised oh, okay. in order to be experienced well, salvation. And Paul makes that point very clearly. He said Abraham was like almost at the end of his experience with God before he was finally circumcised. So the issue here is it's salvation by by the relationship, mm -hmm. it's not by. by okay, but, now, but didn't now. you didn't you read at the beginning here that you were talking about false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on our freedom? Yes, exactly. Okay, that's how the whole thing started out, yeah. and so now we're talking about circumcision, mm -hmm. 
And that's after we mentioned this freedom business. Yes. So the issue is freedom. Okay. So now I'm going to bring that into your world. As Seventh-day Adventists, what special identifying marks set us apart from other churches? Sabbath observance? Our beliefs in the nature of man and the state of the dead? Our acceptance of the spirit of prophecy? The practice of tithing? Our version of health reform? Why do we do these things? Do we have legitimate reasons for doing them even today? Or are they our modern version of circumcision? Are they outdated markers to which we cling in order to show we're different? You ask that question like we should be. <laughs> we I, should be different. I'm asking questions because I want you to answer. Well, you're asking. <laughs> I okay. want to know what Myra thinks. She hasn't said anything <laughs> over there. <laughs> well, I think you guys are arguing over the point, like Gary says, over freedom. And I, I, I think Paul makes it very clear mm -hmm. that you have to know Christ, and that is the core issue. The, the grace that is, is given to us is all there, but with that you will do certain things to bring unity and, and a, a church to God. Okay. So how do we actually determine when it is appropriate to stand up for an essential truth, even when it may seem to be divisive in our church group? When it's my decision to stand up, that's when it's correct. I when it's see. your decision to stand up or Gary's, it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what a lot of us think. Yeah. yeah, it's not true, of course. There's a great deal in the New Testament about Christian freedom, and I wish we had time to. Well, let, let me read just one passage, John eight, thirty-one to thirty-six. So Jesus said to those who believed in him, "If you obey my teaching, you are really my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free." We are the descendants of Abraham, they answered, and we have never been anybody's slaves. What do you mean then by saying, you will be free? Jesus said to them, I am telling you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. A slave does not belong to a family permanently, but a son belongs there forever. If the son sets you free, then you will be really free. So, what kind of freedom is that? Well, Christians are to be free from the slavery to sin, hopefully. Paul says we're supposed to be free from the law of sin and death. Christians who follow Christ are supposed to seek to become more and more like Him. And when doing that, they're supposed to be freed from this slavery to even to the ruling spirits of the universe, he says. And they're also free from the fear of death. But it always turns out to be the Ten Commandments that they worry about. Mm -hmm. And that was defined as the law of liberty. Mm -hmm. James. So it's, there's, there's freedom mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in the Ten Commandments. So what, what does, how does the truth set you free? Okay, here's my, here's my challenge. I'm going I'm to put it to you. I'm going to give you my proposition and you can shoot me down. What does freedom truly mean to a Christian? Can a Christian do whatever he wants to do? Now, if you asked a person from the world what is ultimate, complete freedom, they would say you can do whatever you want to do, right? Even put your hand in the fire. You can, if you want to be, that doesn't mean you're going to do it, but you're free to do it. You're free to do it. Okay? So you can do whatever you want to do. So do, can a Christian do whatever he wants to do? Of course. He can do what he wants to because a real Christian understands what is right to do and why it is right, and he chooses to do that because it is the right thing to do. Thus, because he would never choose to do what is wrong, he is free to do whatever he wants to do because it will always be the right thing to do. What's the characteristics of things that are right? They, they agree with the truth. Are you looking for a list of rules? No, 
I'm just I'm just asking the question. <laughs> I'm not I'm not saying that, but 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 what is what is the characteristics of things that are right? I think we can look at at the life of Christ mm -hmm. as he spent his time with his father and uh, discovered what he wanted what this father wanted him to do and he was a hundred percent in harmony with that when Jesus went out and did as he blame well pleased he did the father's will and we're promised that same thing we can be united with divinity the way Jesus was so that when we do whatever it is our pleasure we do his will Mm -hmm. now, I, I don't think very many of us have get that, attain to that, but you haven't seen I, too hope, many people like that around? I hope that we're on the process mm -hmm. to, to accomplish that. And that's the goal, to be so united with God's divinity that when we come to a situation, we respond to it naturally the way he would want okay. us to. Yeah, when and, I said that there was going to be a united a, a church, that's what I'm referring to, a, a freedom to be who, who we are as Christians so that I don't have to worry that, I, you know, I think we all worry about doing something wrong, that there's something out there that we're going to be doing wrong. And with the freedom that we give to God, we don't have to worry about that if we understand Him. Last week we talked about a passage from Ellen White, Testimonies to Ministers, page 119, where it said, we will know that we do know what is truth. Now let's see if we can fit that in here. How would that fit? A real Christian not only has a, a, a rough idea of what's right, but he has studied it until he understands why it is right. So there's no question in his mind. He knows why it's right. I know that as a medical practitioner, as I go from patient to patient, I need to wash my hands. Why do I need to do that? Well, because I know that there are germs and other things that get on my hands. It's the right thing to do. I don't have to stop and ask, let's see, should I do this or no, I'm not too sure? No, I know it's the right thing to do. But you do have to make the decision. When you're in the, in the, the crush of the clinic and you've mm -hmm. got to get that next 25 patients through, <laughs> yeah. do I take the time to do it or not? Yeah, that's true. But I know what's right to do. That's right. Do I take the time to obey the rule that says that I have to wash my hands in between no, patients? No, I, I, I think the <laughs> I, yeah. If you do yeah. wash your hands, your, your patients are blessed. Yes. Because they don't have to suffer the curse of your... <laughs> if you understand, you can do it his way. If you don't know and the, and the, and the rule is there, you do it that way. Maybe well, the one characteristic of what is right is because it is God's will. Well, sure. and, and it's God's I mean, will because it is said. right. That's what you said. Yeah. yeah. You, that, that God's will is what we're trying to find out with, with finding out what's yeah. right. Sure. While we all want to be more like Jesus, God never intended for us to be cookie cutter Christians, all exactly alike and all doing exactly the same things. Each of us has been given our own gifts and talents. Thus, each of us has a different set of tasks assigned to us by God. Peter was apostle to the circumcised, Paul to the uncircumcised. Each of them had individual skills appropriate to their tasks. In some cases, their messages may have sounded different because of the different audiences they were addressing. And we know that's true, don't we? Mm -hmm. we, we understand that. Which raises one raises our question again, are we absolutely sure about the core beliefs and values that compose the gospel so that we can adapt our teachings and behaviors to different situations without compromising those core beliefs of the gospel? Do we, in other words, is that core solid? What did Paul say? If someone comes and preaches a different gospel than the one I preach to you, be accursed. may he be condemned to hell. He felt that that core message. Paul wasn't saying, 
trust in me. I'm the one that's, he says, the message I got from God is absolutely certain. There is no question about it. That's he, what he said. He had discovered that that was God's will. Yeah. And he was going for it. Mm -hmm. That looks like a, uh, sure. <clears throat> that looks like a course for confrontation to me. Yeah. That's it what was. it was. That's why we're talking about it. So how do you get unity out of that? I mean, Norman, he's, he knows that this well, is the way this particular thing is, and I know this is the way this, and Myra over here, she's got this particular yeah, but core it thing. it was about circumcision. It was about the core belief in God. And Paul and was not being self-centered there, no. was he? No, it wasn't, it wasn't about Paul. No, it was about saying, God. Right, that's right. So It's not about Paul. It's about God. His ego was not on the line. No. No, it was when... I'm going to assume that Peter, down there in Jerusalem, when Paul and Barnabas showed up with Titus, I'm going to assume that he was kind of on the side of the people that need circumcision. So wasn't but, he? What, but I, I mean, I, I would like to point out, if you go over and read Acts 15, verses 28 and 29, when it was all done and said, they all shook hands and said, we agree. The core gospel hasn't been changed. But you know, to get to the point where they agreed, <laughs> yeah. they had to admit there were differences. Admit there is differences, right? And not get upset. Mm -hmm. And and people are scared to get people upset, but yet we we have to go through because those we things miss that the core. We're looking so much at the differences and not looking at the core. Well, the differences aren't too bad. I, I'm thinking the reaction to those differences. Is it a Christian reaction or is it a worldly reaction where you pick up a gun and I take care of this through force? The core didn't come through very well. So really it doesn't really make any difference whether you're baptized or sprinkled. It doesn't make any difference whether you, at communion, whether you wash people's feet or whether you celebrate in a way that you don't wash people's feet. You're kind of talking in universal language there. I don't think that that's, that oh, can't go that I'm far. I'm, I'm trying to. <laughs> well, yeah. once again, the question is, will there be people saved who've only been sprinkled? Yes. Will there be people saved who have been immersed by, bapti by baptism? Yes. But we're not the ones who to, to make those decisions. Let me take the flip side of that. Mm -hmm. Will there be people lost mm -hmm because they refused to be baptized and only wanted to be sprinkled. Possibly. <laughs> Even when they know the difference? Oh, and they, well, yeah. I'm assuming that, that they... Okay, that knowing the difference. I thought, knowing the difference. Okay, knowing the difference. Well, I have to assume that if we know the truth, we're going to follow it. Okay, and if you don't follow it, then it's a problem. Then it's a problem. When okay. you know God's will, you will follow it. Mm -hmm. There will also be people who say people saved who have not been baptized and who have not been sprinkled. Yeah. Well, but the problem comes... I've never heard the name of Jesus. That's right. The problem comes not when I do what I think I should be doing. It's when I insist that Norm does what I think ought to be done. Well, and it's also a problem when I think I'll do what I think is right and I don't care what anybody say, else says. That's well, at least you're not mm. forcing Norm to do anything. Yeah. I well, think you're yeah. a lot better off in that position than what, what was just said well, there'll, here. There'll be a group in the end who believe one way and they are going to force as many people as they can to do it their way. And Revelation 13 talks about them. That's exactly right. And it's happened all through history also. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, so Nebuchadnezzar. we're not worried about that. But there's also going to be a group of people who say, I don't care what anybody says. This is the way I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. And going one group is going to be saved and the other group is going mm -hmm. to be lost. Yeah. Well, l let me take another example from our current experience. What are the most effective ways of Christian evangelism? What should we as Christians be doing to help finish the gospel? Adventists have almost been, have been almost wedded to the idea of public evangelism by efforts, or we sometimes call them crusades, never call them that in a Muslim crowd, in form of mass public meetings. This form of evangelism places almost all the responsibility on the pastor or evangelist, which is not at all what God intended. God intends for each one of us to find ways to do personal evangelism 
appropriate to us and our friends. Converts who come into the church this way are much more likely to remain in the church than are those who have come in exclusively as a result of some mass campaign. And I, I don't need to, to spell that out, but you all are very aware that that's true. So in this setting, unity and diversity means that each of us is to exercise his or her talents and at the same time praise God for what has been accomplished by others in the church through their talents. Mm -hmm. If you bring in somebody using your talents in a one way, I'm going to say amen, brother. And I hope you will be able to say, if I bring in somebody to the church to using my talents in a different setting, you will be also able to say amen. You mean I can't be jealous of you? If you're <laughs> jealous, maybe you go, it's time for you to go out and do something. See if you can do the same thing. And I might remind you that Jesus said there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one, over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need to repent. So I think that's a pretty compelling argument. And so that raises our question, what is the basis of Christian unity? Do we have a model? What about the Trinity? You know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, don't they live and work in perfect harmony? each with his own responsibilities. If we lived and worked like that in perfect harmony and love, would the world notice? And I, one of my favorite verses, John 13, 35, if you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you're my disciples. What does that say about the rest of the world? They don't get along very well, right? Uh, they throw <laughs> chairs at each other. Right? Yeah, exactly. They get so, mad, they, they stick it to each other, they cause churches to fall. Mm -hmm. to Does that mean love one another as humans, as members of a human family, or love one another in the context of the Christian family? I think it has to be the Christian family because this is something that God says you know, Jesus himself said, if you exhibit this kind of love, and the word is akapao, you know, from which we get agape, mm -hmm. that kind of love, the world is going gonna, is gonna to notice. They can't, they can't avoid noticing these people are different. But wouldn't, wouldn't they notice that? Wouldn't they be more likely to notice it if that kind of love was exhibited to one of them? as opposed to between two church members. And hopefully that's what comes next. Mm. That's the plan. Well, you know, there are a number of places where Paul talks about the gifts that we are supposed to have, the talents, etc. Romans 12, 5, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, starting with verse 12 through 27, Ephesians 3, verse 6, 5, verse 23 is just some examples. These verses make it very clear that although, though we may be different, you know, Paul talks about the different parts of the body and the eye can't say, I don't need an ear, and the eye can't say, I don't need a hand or I don't need a foot. We need all parts of the body. Each one of us has a different task, task to do, a different role to play. We're all part of Christ's body, he says, just in so many words. We may be separate parts, but whether we're Jew, whether we're Gentile, we're still, whether we're a member of any race, culture, language, nation, we're all members of that same body and share in the promise that God made through Jesus Christ. So now we come to, in the last few minutes we got here, the second part of Galatians 2. And here we get to test our hypotheses, okay? But when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him, Paul, of course, speaking here, I opposed him in public because he was clearly wrong. Before some men who had been sent by James arrived there, Peter had been eating with the Gentile brothers and sisters. Now, did Peter think that was the right thing to do or not? The right thing to do. He was, being, he was doing the right thing. He, was he, he believed, really, in light of, maybe he wasn't real comfortable doing it, but in light of what he knew through the Cornelius experience, he knew that that was the right thing to do. Okay? 
But after these men arrived, he drew back and would not eat with the Gentiles, because he was afraid of those who were in favor of circumcising them. The other Jewish brothers and sisters also started acting like cowards, along with Peter. And even Barnabas was swept along by their cowardly action. When I saw that they were not walking in a straight path in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, now notice this is very important, Peter, what, what was he saying? He was saying to Peter, to his face, and in front of them all, there was nothing, he wasn't, you know what I know, you know did you know what so-and-so did, blah, 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 you know, like it usually happens, you know? Right there in public, in Peter to his face, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you have been living like a Gentile. We all know that. We've seen you do it. Not like a Jew. How then can you dream of forcing Gentiles to live like Jews? Oops. <laughs> you, know, you know, as you read this, don't you see the chemistry that's happening in this room here? Mm -hmm. That first they're all sitting doing everything right, and then these people walk in. Mm -hmm. They are authorities that walk in. Mm -hmm. And it's the power of the authority that made him change mm -hmm. right then. And, and, and Paul overcame that power by just saying, nope, I'm not going to let this chemistry do anything to me. Mm -hmm. And he, he chastised Peter for having it do something to him. I thought Peter was the authority. Yeah, wasn't he the first pope? Well, that's debatable, but <laughs> he certainly, I mean, the perception is that he's a significant influence down yeah. here. Yeah. If there's anybody that has authority, he's one of the guys that does. Yeah. Well, in what ways are we like Peter in this situation? Do we have any ingrained prejudices? Do they hinder our personal evangelism? Do we believe in a different manner, or do we behave in a different manner when we are with other Christians than we do when we are by ourselves or with non-church members? Yeah. Well, do you think Why are you saying yes? Yeah. <laughs> do you think it was this experience that Peter was thinking of when he said, Paul has some kind of hard things to say? <laughs> Possibly. Hard things to understand. Possibly, yeah. Well. What was Peter actually doing in, Ant in Antioch that caused this controversy? Yielding to authority. Well, he was a coward. Paul calls him a coward. Well, most cowards yield to authority. Yeah. Peter, following God's instructions, had been one of the foremost Christian leaders to welcome Gentiles into the church. And you can read the story about Cornelius and his family in Acts 10. So. I, want to, I want to take Gary on on that one. Okay. <laughs> Paul was appealing to his authority. These guys were appealing to their authority. No, he was not appealing to authority. He was appealing to what was right. He said, well, I got authority. it from God who told me on the road to Damascus. He was appealing to his authority. And they were appealing to their authority. The issue is which person, which, which situation, right. which which authority is right? Well, I I think that my definition of authority and yours is different. Well, that may be. I'm thinking that authority is the wrong thing when it makes you do something instead of your reasoning making you do something. That's what I'm talking about. And when Paul talked, he was still talking with, through reason. He wasn't talking, about, talking based on his bigness coming in and saying, you do it this way. Don't you think after that Cornelius experience in Acts 10, Peter should have been, able, should have been the one standing up and saying, absolutely, there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles we should be willing to sit down with these Gentiles. Well, that's what so, I was saying about this chemistry. It, it doesn't come out that way all the time. Sounds like they made the wrong guy Pope. <laughs> <laughs> they should have made Peter Paul did Pope. He figure it out at the end he of, did. of Acts 15. He, it just he said shows how easily... Gospel has, is to go to the Gentiles. We can be swayed yeah. by 
outside influence right. or inside influence if we don't believe what it's well our core belief. That's right. The word that Paul uses here describing Peter is the Greek word for hypocrite. That's a pretty strong word. In are we practicing? Yes. Are we following any practices in our churches today that might be identified as hypocrisy? No. Uh, Let me explore <laughs> that just a little bit. Okay. Are you saying by that, are we doing things in our church because there are practices in other churches and we do it just so that we can... We want to look good. We, 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 look don't, good. we don't want to rub anybody the wrong way. Okay. Well, on Paul's day, and our, we're running by, out of time by, here, so we need to... Yeah? By what? <laughs> I wish we had time to discuss that. <laughs> Good thing we only have two minutes left. Yeah. <laughs> in Paul's day, there were Jewish synagogues scattered around the Mediterranean. In those synagogues, there were Gentiles, quite a number of them, that the Jews accepted to worship with them because they accepted almost all the Jewish ceremonies, ceremonial systems, but usually they were not circumcised. But they were considered second-class saints. They were called God-fearers. The, the, the Jews recognized these people. So now the Judaizers are trying to bring some of that same kind of idea into the Christian church and saying, we, wanna, we don't want to be God-fearers here. We want some super Christians. We want some special ones, the ones who are not only believing in the, in the truth of God, the truth by faith, they're, they're practicing all the Jewish ceremonies. Well, Paul recognized clearly that this was not the way of truth. This was going to undermine the truth of the gospel. So anyone who wants to add or subtract anything from the truth that Paul presented was compromising the gospel, according to Galatians 5.2. Was Paul justified in his criticism of Peter? Would you do what Paul did? Have you ever been criticized as Peter was for some of your Christian beliefs or behaviors? Do we ever succumb to peer pressure? Customs and practices have changed a lot in our church over the past 50 years. Is this as God would have it? Or are we gradually being sucked into worldly practices by peer pressure? If Peter had written about his confrontation with Paul in the church in Antioch, what do you think he would have said? Are you more like a Peter or more like a Paul? Those of us who believe in the larger view, the trust, healing model of the plan of salvation, may be viewed by some as splitters. Is, there, is that a fair characterization? Or is this view of God and this view of the plan of salvation, a core essential part of the gospel. And we'll leave that question with you until next week. See you then.